collects everything from Perry Reese to Alistair Crowley. I have an interview coming up in a minute with Jason Horsley. We talk a lot about the cultural influence of Alistair Crowley. Do you need any more evidence than a Scooby-Doo movie? Crowley. (laughs) Or a Buffy the Vampire episode? So this is a really long interview. I think there's a ton of good stuff in it. Here are some clips from the show. You bring a case like Crowley and you put him under the microscope and you see what I saw with Vice Kings. How far was he willing to take that? He was willing to take that all the way. He was, he, he was looking for the, what he perceived as the most evil act possible, the, the unforgivable sin, you know, this in the Bible, the sin that the Holy Spirit, the sin against the Holy Spirit that's unforgivable, and then committing it as a way to completely... Uh, the path of transgression, completely free himself from social conditioning, from false morality, you know. And we're, we're living in a culture and climate that advocates this. It's all over. I mean, if somebody is, is consciously deceiving, they would have to also be deluded as well. I mean, they would have to have some rationale for doing it that would be fundamentally delusional. I mean, I do believe there's an innate moral sense that we have biologically even, that that we have a sense of of what's right and wrong in any given moment. You know, how effective you can be with 90 to 95% just true, agree with you, and win your trust so that I can then use that to kind of switch things in a different way. It's spin, isn't it? And my sense with that, with with Lavender, and he did help me see something, uh, ironically, is, is that... I started to get a sense that it was to do with ideological affiliation, if you like, that the Lavender, in my, in my impression anyway, is, is ideologically affiliated with the occult values and systems and methodologies. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris. Today, we welcome Jason Horsley back to Skeptico. Jason is the author of several books, including Prisoner of Infinity, which we talked about during a previous episode of Skeptico. Also, The Vice of Kings, How Socialism, Occultism, and the Sexual Revolution Engineered a Culture of Abuse, a book I'm sure we will be referencing frequently today, and a new upcoming book titled 16 Maps of Hell, The Unraveling of a Hollywood Superculture. I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about that, but I I hope we do. It sounds intriguing. I don't really do the book interview thing, as you know, Jason, but I just got to let people know about those fantastic books because they're going to want to check them out. Also wanted to let them know about, you have really a terrific podcast, The Liminalist, you know, that liminal area between, well, between whatever this is and whatever that is and an outstanding website blog, which we'll be referencing as well, called Autoculture. And of course, people can find all that and follow you. So all that stuff is great, but I really wanted to do something different. I first wanted to introduce people to, reintroduce people to you. We did have that interview before, but you continue to do just such phenomenally outstanding work and and produce stuff. And I'm just blown away. I mean, I think it's brilliant. And every time I go to dip into some of your stuff, I'm like, I need to just grab a piece and I wind up just getting more and more and more, listening to more, reading to more. You're, You're brilliant, brilliant writing, brilliant audio presentation. This dialogue thing you have going on is, is terrific. But the other thing that I really like and respect about you, Jason, is your, your personal courage that you demonstrate over and over again about just putting yourself out there. And a lot of people can do that, but they don't have the tenacity that you have. And like one of the things that, that really just compelled me to contact you again was this email exchange you have with Peter Lavenda. And we're going to try and unravel that in this larger context. But your tenacity to continue to go after Lavenda in a very appropriate way in these email exchanges. And I can't tell you the number of exchanges I've had with people where I go, this guy 
clearly he's he's a psyop he's psyop 100 percent. why are you buying into this shit and you rather than just ranting and and no one ever listens to me because i can't back it up you back it up man you back it up in the dialogue you had with him and you back it up in terms of pulling together a lot of other pieces so i really really appreciate that about what you do and i'm super excited to have you back on skeptico well thanks alex thanks for all those kind words and um that last point because i do i mean that is one of the hardest things in in life is to confront people when we feel that we're being deceived and there's just the whole social protocol that says thou shalt not do that and it is something that it's a fine line to walk because it can be uh, mm, it can be driven by neurotic things. I'm aware of that. Like you know, I might have father issues or brother issues, and and certainly I got triggered in that exchange with Peter Lavender. But and it would have been easy for me to back off because of just just being not sure of myself, and he's an authority figure, and so on and so forth. But you're right. I didn't. I persisted and. And then when it came to Vice of Kings, I did a lot more digging. And as, as you know, if you've read it, I found an awful lot of much more compelling evidence around that. So it seemed like it was worth it. It was worth, you know, standing up for my own personal sense of integrity and being willing to confront this figure uh, as a way to really get a better sense of <clears throat> the kind of deception that goes on in, in this community and in this world and around these subjects and really a rubber meeting road. I mean, make it personal and practical and experiential, not abstract, not theoretical. Uh, it's much more exciting and much more interesting. It's, it's riskier, but I think the end result is a lot more meaningful. Well, you know, I think there's just a ton to unpack there. And we're going to try and do that. Let's back up and make sure that, well, I, I think we have to, you know, back up and talk about the Peter Lavenda incident that, you know, as you said, in some sense, it's the whole story in some ways. It's the whole story that we're going to tell today about deception, about evil and how we understand evil, what our role is in evil, what our culture's role is in evil, what our intelligence organizations role is in evil mm. but i think in this deception part i think is just so brilliant the way that you put it because i think we're all trying to wrestle with to what extent we're being deceived who the deceptors are whether we're deceiving ourselves whether our culture is engineered to deceive us i could go on and on but what i've thrown up there on the screen which is you know, kind of what I wanted to base this on, because I mentioned to you when I sent you that email, I'm writing this book. So this book, you know, I mean, I don't know why anyone writes books these days, but you write mm -hmm. books and some people read them and I've read your books and they, they impacted me. And I guess that's all I hope to do with my book, Why Evil Matters, is just to maybe reach a couple of people at the right time who go, gee, why aren't we really dealing with this evil question in a kind of more deeper, intellectual, kind of pre-scientific way? And that's really the premise of the book. And I, I, I think when you talk about evil, uh, one thing that I think comes up a lot to me in the conversations I have is the Aleister Crowley thing. And I call it, I call it the Aleister Crowley test. You know what I mean by that? Like, if, if you just tell people, you bring up Aleister Crowley, right? And you know you're going to get a couple of canned reactions. And it's the ability people have, I think, to handle that topic, however they do, to me is almost like a shortcut litmus test for where they're at in this larger understanding of evil, deception, left-hand path, uh, and, and uh, both personally, but also just in kind of the cultural spy Peter Lavenda thing that we'll get into. But as usual, I'm kind of laying a lot on the table and jumping way ahead of the story. So let me, let me back up or let you back up, if you could. You've written brilliantly and extensively 
on Crowley. Can you give folks just, if they're coming at this new and they can't understand the deep dive inside baseball stuff we've gotten into, back up, who is Aleister Crowley? You know, what does he represent in our culture? Why is he important? Why does he matter? Can you just kind of start with the basics maybe? Mm. Well, I guess even <laughs> starting with the basics, there's a lot of different angles. So where I tend to start with Crowley and what seems to me what makes him indisputably significant is his influence. And from two perspectives, like the, the proof of his, his influence uh, is indisputable. I mean, the, the easy go-to is, is pop music of the 60s and 70s. So he's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And he's, he's cited in, in David Bowie's Hunky Dory, which was very influential for me as, a, as an adolescent. And so on, Jimmy Page, you know, Marilyn Manson. There's just no end to his, his influence several decades and several different musical movements uh so on from the one side there's that there's, that's irrefutable from the other side is is how did he have that much influence and um uh how deliberate and how intentional was that and i think i look at in vice of kings the evidence that that crowley was not what he seems in terms of this creative occult outlier, this iconoclast who is pursuing these extreme transgressions in order to liberate humanity. That's half the story, but it's also maybe a half a cover story. And that his influence, I think, was at least partially um, assisted, let's say, that he was, just as there's evidence that Crowley was an intelligence agent and an operative, and was functioning at that level. It, it tends to be that the biographers have separated those two things out. On the one hand, he's this independent artist, writer, occultist. On the other hand, he also dabbled uh, in uh, intelligence work. And that they're almost like separate things. Now, the connecting areas, of course, he was a member of occult secret societies and even created his own, the, the AA, which was a, a splinter of the OTO. Hold on, before we... we... We, we bury people, yeah. there's so many parts of that, right? So we bury people with all these acronyms and we bury people with the cover story. But I, I do want to kind of back up because when you talk about the cover story, we also have to understand the other touch point that Crowley is today inside of the magic culture that is kind of a growing subculture, Netflix culture, streaming it's interwoven through all of that, that the idea of the occult, that there's something hidden, that there's something you don't know about, but it's a deeper truth. And there's this do what thou wilt famous ethos that is kind of woven through our culture in another way that we don't quite understand its origins until people tell you about Aleister Crowley and they kind of whisper it in your ear and then you go, oh, wow, you mean there's this other secret sage of the, of the esoteric that I need to, to kind of get in touch with. It, l let, me, let me do this if I can. I pulled out some clips some, from some really excellent interviews you've done. Let me play some of those. My first contact with Crowley was through David Bowie, the album Hunky Dory, which I heard in my brother's bedroom. And that might seem like a trivial thing or an odd place to start, but how a virus enters us is, is, is very key, I think. Whether, how open we are, how vulnerable we are in that moment is going to determine how, how infected we are. And I'd say that that was the case with the Crowley virus, that there was a delivery device, it was a combination of the culture and my family environment, the David Bowie, who I discovered thereby through my brother, who was never a David Bowie fan. And my brother was, I was very rarely in his bedroom because he didn't let me hang around with him at all. He was an older brother. And, and so I think 
you know, talk about priming, like if you have a really positive experience of something the first time around, then you're going to be much more susceptible to ignoring the negative aspects of it because of that initial priming. So in some weird way, I think I was primed for Crowley by that combination of hearing David Bowie sing his name in my brother's uh, attic bedroom. So there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me just turn it over to you. What are some of your thoughts listening to that again? Mm. Well, I mean, it's still going on, that's the thing. I mean, I'm still, the reason I write these books as I do is, and this latest one about Hollywood is getting much more specific. I'm trying to uh, uh, extract the virus. I'm trying to purge the virus from my system. But at the same time, there's a reason why I let it in, which isn't just nefarious and malignant. Like there's a reason, uh, one can develop immunity, of course, it's quite topical with all this stuff around the COVID now, but one develops immunity by exposure to, to viruses, or what we call viruses, and one can observe their effects and thereby, you know, analyze and understand them. So where I'm at now is I'm like, well, I let this virus in and uh, I'm trying to get it out and and necessary to getting it out of my system somehow seems to be breaking it down to its constituent parts and understanding what made me vulnerable to it and what, what's the affinity or the sympathy between myself and my own trauma and that, that cultural virus. And then that leads to these books and these analyses, which hopefully are helpful to others. So Hold on on that. What if it really is about deception? What if it is not even so much a part of your personal journey. What if it's an unnecessary step along your personal journey? And that's one thing I'd like to at least explore both in my book and in this interview is that just because Crowley is there and just because Johnny Depp is wrapping his arm around Damian Eccles, who was the Crowley follower from the West Memphis Three and over and over again, our culture has told us a oh, Crowley and it's cool. Maybe we don't have to go there. Maybe we don't have to uh, explore that and we can step past it. And I'm not saying it's like all evil and bad if you do it. I'm just questioning the, the as I think you were, even the, because there's two ways to read what you're saying. One is to say, hey, it's there and you got to deal with it. And the other is to say, you know, Let's look at this. Let's be informed beforehand so maybe we can step around the pothole in the first place. No, I mean, it makes sense. And certainly, but this is a sort of conundrum I have. I also have it around psychedelics because I feel that psychedelics was a mistake for me by and large. And therefore, that maybe I can use my experience of them to help others avoid the same pitfalls. So this is definitely the case with Crowley and occultism. I would warn others against it. But what... It, I mean, this is right to the core of your question, you know, why evil matters, which is an interesting phrase in itself, because um, there is a correspond. I mean, you're talking about the, the allure and the cool of Crowley and, and all that stuff. Very prominent in our culture, as I said, since the 60s on, it's been it's this meme that's been generated. But you must also be aware that coexistent with that, there's a not necessarily Christian, but often Christian a uh, counter push saying that Crowley is just evil and, and just stay away from it. It's just sick. It's venal. It's psychopathic. And although I, I probably agree with the diagnosis 90%, it's not really fruitful. And it's if you just dismiss evil, if you just say it's evil, stay away from it because uh, it doesn't allow for understanding and it, and it demonizes and it scapegoats and it, and it, just perpetuates this division there the and of course crowley himself promoted his evil and that was part of his cool so the people who think that crowley's cool are not going to be discouraged by people saying he's evil right that's the problem i think that's exactly the problem i think you immediately i think understood the premise of the book just by the title which so few people do you know and i've already done interviews on the book and people are immediately want to go to, is this evil? Is that evil? Do you mean this is evil? And it's like, mm. no, you're, you're, you're trying to make a list or quantify evil or compare evil. I wrote this first book, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything. And the premise of the book was that if you get consciousness wrong, 
if you think consciousness is an illusion, if you think we're all biological robots in a meaningless universe, well then you really can't get anything right in science because you'll never factor in consciousness. And the premise of the second book, Why Evil Matters, is that if you're not willing to explore evil, and evil becomes really a shorthand for saying these extended consciousness realms that extend beyond this biological robot, I'm just here in my brain. If you're not willing to, to explore what might extend beyond our minute by minute experience, and if you're not willing to include evil in that, then you're not really going to say anything meaningful about spirituality, whatever that means. So yeah, I'm trying to draw attention to that, that we've been kind of put in a box with evil, where it's like, it's evil, it's either this very narrowly defined thing that this old book tells you about, and you're shamed into believing through either being a part of one of these cultish religions like Christianity, or it's a complete denial. It's the, it's the do what thou wilt denial of evil that's not only from Crowley, but if you look in the scientific realms, you know, like you have and I have, it, you know, it's, it's embedded in that materialist message. Of course there's no evil. I mean, there isn't even free will. There's nothing. You are just a biological robot. How could there be evil in that? So to me, that's why, that's the whole why evil matters things. It's because we're kind of, the walls are, <laughs> you know, we're Indiana Jones and the walls are closing in on both sides with religion on one hand and scientism on the other. And I think Crowley as a as an agent of that process, I think is is really kind of interesting. Yeah. So and to me, you know, the area where we can let some air in is, is psychology. And now of course psychology is traced back to Freud and even Jung. It's it's heavily compromised, but still at least as a, as a working model, it, it allows for both a scientific view and a religious view, but primarily it's, it's, a, it's a subjective view. It's, a, it's something we can refer to and understand ourselves and by looking at ourselves. And we're all human beings and we all have psyches that are whatever, configured in the same way, in the same way biologically we're the same. So uh, um, my approach with Crowley, see, isn't, isn't that Crowley was evil, it's that he was psychologically damaged and that we can see this in the inconsistencies in his work and the hypocrisy and the abuses and the corruption and what we would think of as evil behaviors. All that can be seen psychologically and it makes his work fundamentally invalid. It invalidates it. And at the same time, it corresponds with how Crowley himself was useful for an, an instrument of these much larger apparatuses of, of psychosocial control and engineering, which um, create somebody like Crowley or create these viruses and perpetuate the trauma as this much larger egregore, you might say, of, of ancestral trauma, which has become so endemic and so virulent that the word evil isn't a misnomer really i mean it, it, the word evil i don't use it much except when we're talking about it in this meta way like I, I i try and avoid saying this is evil or that is evil or he is evil because i think it, it 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 well it just doesn't really work this is not where i thought this would go but it's a really interesting uh point so let me uh back up and i know i'm talking a lot for really an interview with you but we got to have this conversation so like mm -hmm. and this is a story that everyone who's listened to this show probably has heard 50 times by now but it's it's okay i'll do it again because we got to get it out there so i'm interviewing this guy Ohio State University religion professor, Dr. Hugh Urban. He's written this fantastic book on Scientology. Fantastic, I don't know, but fantastic. Well-received, everyone thinks it's great. It's about Scientology as a new religion. Well, right off the bat, is this a new religion? Can't we just call it for what it is, a cult? No, we can't call it a cult because we're in the... We're in academia. We can't identify something as evil. You know, it's back to this relativism. There's no evil thing. So in his research, Hugh Urban is 
doing an historical breakdown of Scientology. And he says, yes, I can confirm that L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, was in the desert with Jack Parsons. And Jack Parsons was in communication with Crowley. And they had orchestrated this sex magic ritual to bring forth the whore of Babylon with the hopes of conceiving the Antichrist and thereby controlling the world, you know? So again, this guy says, yes, that did happen. And I said, okay, pause. You know, don't we need to kind of explore that a little bit? And he goes, no, Alex, we don't, because it doesn't matter if it's true. It matters only if they believed it were true. And my point, and this kind of gets to the psychology thing, right? Because that's something you might hear. That's definitely something you would hear some psychologists say. And my point was, no, that's completely backwards. The first thing we have to know is whether or not we should take seriously that claim. Whether there is an extended consciousness realm that they were trying to connect with, is there such a thing? Is it possible to connect with such realms? Is it possible that those realms can have an effect on this material world? I'm not saying we have to, you know, have some firm answer on that, but we have to be able to put that on the table. Well, I mean, I agree with that. I don't think that I was sidestepping the question of whether evil exists, however. But what I was saying is it it doesn't work to call something evil for me anyway uh, in a number of ways one is as i've already said that people who are already drawn to those things it's not going to wash for them anyway um so that's one thing but the other is but, just well, why, why should we care no Say, but i um, understand that perspective you see because if, if we're going to posit i mean let's cut to the chase and if we're going to posit satan as an actual entity which is almost necessary if you start talking about evil it's not but it, it's get you're getting in that realm then we've got to start ask well what is satan you know god created satan therefore satan must be a principle in the universe that is divinely ordained this is the problem with christianity is this is an inherent contradiction in it right it's that's a problem with christianity it isn't a problem with evil per se satan we can both agree satan yeah. if you try and look at satan historically he slips through your fingers right he's not there you know yeah. I, I often reference richard smoley the esteemed religious scholar and author of the book, uh, How God Became God. And there's a guy who goes and tries to trace Satan. He goes, he's, he's not there. You go in the, in the pre-Torah, way back Judaic text, he doesn't exist. And then a few hundred years later, Zoroaster kind of introduces this dualism and all of a sudden it pops up in his books. It's not there, but no one would deny that to whatever extent we're co-creators of this reality, Satan sure seems to be here now so it's like i mean deconstructing that is a whole four hour thing we could have but christianity well, but, is clearly corrupted so i, I don't think we want to come as good as an extreme or it's a very clear cut sort of example on the embodiment of evil so to speak but the same can be applied to evil is my point like the people who who do evil the people who perpetuate evil the people who advocate for evil they have very convincing arguments for it they're very sophisticated like what what do you think is convincing well, the, the path of transgression that i mean when i say convincing i mean i'm not convinced by them i don't want to you know be misunderstood there i think that they're uh, they're rationalizations but rationalizations can be very sophisticated and so the most obvious one is, is, is the Jungian approach, that the shadow, that we need to integrate the shadow, as in all the parts of ourselves, that our consciousness that we've disowned um, in order to maintain an, a socialized ego self that ha feels like it has control over life, which is illusory. And in order to actually suppress things into the unconscious that we find difficult, we create this shadow of everything that we don't like and in order to become whole we have to integrate all those things we have to become conscious of them and to some extent we have to we have to re-own them and even enact them you can see how that can you know i looked at this with john deruta the canadian guru who had this rationale for having sex with his followers and keeping it secret and he believed or claimed to believe he was battling satan internally and that part of that battle meant that he had to actually commit acts that he considered evil in order to, you know, blah, 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 integrate the shadow, right? And, and 
you know, the thin end of this wedge is true. Like we do, I know in my life, I've had to see my own capacity to evil, for evil and accept it. And some of that has involved conscious enactments of it because it's the only way I'd let myself see it. And then you bring a case like Crowley and you put him under the microscope and you see what I saw with Vice Kings. How far was he willing to take that? He was willing to take that all the way. He was, he, he was looking for the, what he perceived as the most evil act possible, the, the unforgivable sin, you know, this in the Bible, the sin that the Holy Spirit, the sin against the Holy Spirit that's unforgivable, and then committing it as a way to completely, uh, the path of transgression, completely free himself from social conditioning, from false morality, you know? And we're, we're living in a culture and climate that advocates this. It's all over. You know? yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know where <laughs> we're going to get back to deconstructing that because those are such amazingly important, you know, topics. And I think that the, the do what thou wilt culture I think that that we are a part of definitely has an appeal for a lot of the reasons that you said, and they're not all uh, completely understandable. But I think one of the things that I like that you're kind of bringing forward, but I want to emphasize it even further, is this idea of transgression, this idea of the iconoclastic rebellion against. And usually what that means is a rebellion against, again, this equally corrupted system of social engineering mind control that is Christianity. And I really think, you know, until you do a deep dive and really understand the roots of Christianity being about social engineering and control, then you can't understand the juxtaposition of, you know, the, the transgressionism, denialism, do what thou wilt, you know, express yourself I pulled up, if we cannot be saints, let us all be sinners, which is the, you know, if anyone's heard of the Sabbatean Frankish thing, uh, here's a guy, this is uh, Anthony Mueller on Medium, and I always point people to this because we have a tendency to think that the Jacob Frank thing is fake or that it's just cooked up by some people with an agenda and no, it's just a real thing. And it's been in history for a long time. Jacob Frank was in, lived in the 1700s. And it was the same thing. It was like, and they, again, they tied it back in this kind of crazy cultish way to the Bible. They said, look, the Bible says that the return to the kingdom will only come when we're all saints or we're all sinners. And we sure as hell can't all be saints. So here's the best path. This is logical, people. Like your, like your guru guy, you know, the twisted logic, the deception. We'll all be sinners. And let's go on. Let's take on the job of being the greatest sinners we can be. So this is just another instance of the same thing. But when you understand this history, I think it's easier to see the head fake deception that was Crowley. But it just does amaze me maybe getting back to where I want to get with the Peter Lavenda stuff, it amazes me how many people can't penetrate this. It's just, it's just, they can't get through it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, one key point here, I think is, is when does deception become unconscious behavior and vice versa like can we determine the difference between somebody who's actually deceiving and somebody who's acting unconsciously uh, and certainly that you know somebody is more effective at deceiving others if they can deceive themselves and at that point they would be deluded and therefore acting unconsciously and that's a very general thing but i just wanted to raise that there as a general point um well, this is also yeah. an interesting point about the useful idiot versus the lifetime player, you know. So the useful idiot is someone who believes, has just either naively or has been somehow convinced or duped into believing what they're doing. And the player, which is, again, if we ever get to Peter Lavenda, we'll talk about, is maybe if somebody go, you know, he keeps popping up too many times in the wrong place in terms of orchestrating these things for me to just accept that he's just kind of been duped himself, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, 
I think it's both. I think it's always going to be both. I mean, if somebody is, is consciously deceiving, they would have to also be deluded as well. I mean, they would have to have some rationale for doing it that would be fundamentally delusional. I mean, I do believe there's an innate moral sense that we have, biologically even, that, that, that we have a sense of, of what's right and wrong in any given moment. And so I think that any kind of deception is, is sourced in a self-deception got to emphasize that that is a beautiful point i think it's a central point to all of this and that is that if you don't that is that the the best evidence we have suggests that there is a moral imperative and again that's my approach is to say that's the evidence folks the evidence if you look at near-death experience, if you look at all the wisdom traditions, if you look at all the accumulated knowledge throughout time, as well as most everyone's personal experience, there is this sense of what's right and wrong. And I think you just made a beautiful point about deceiving someone is somehow violating that. And I think that might get us closer to I hate to go with the de definition of evil, but that's where everyone wants to go. I mm. think that starts creeping towards a definition of evil. And what I would add to it is that, to me, the distinction between darkness, which is the force, which is the energy, which isn't evil, it just is, and the act of evil, which I think we see in this world, and we assume it just kind of mirrors itself in the extended world, is an attempt to, the best way I can put it, is to crush someone's soul, is to somehow impede their progress towards something better and good, and instead to try and pull them over towards the dark. And that's what I think to, in my mind, evil is. Evil is that, is that verb, is that action that wants to pull a soul into the darkness because that's where they feel most comfortable. Do you have any thoughts on that? Misery loves company. It's, it's funny because I'm just watching this Christmas Carol of a couple of years ago, the remake or the revert version of it was Guy Pierce, and of course, you know, famous story of Scrooge. And uh, it was occurring to me while watching, it's very well done and it incorporates sort of, you know, the ghosts and the, the occult aspects of the story and kind of beefs them up for our modern sensibilities. And it occurred to me while watching it that one of the reasons this story has such resonance over such a long period of time is it's, it's essentially true. It's, it's describing a mechanism within existence and you say it's biological, but it transcends biology. It's a spiritual uh, principle that our wrongdoings will always catch up with us inevitably whether if not in this life then in the next and, uh, and we shall be the judge of those actions which is also embedded in that in that script isn't it right there won't be this yeah. white bearded guy on the cloud judging no you will judge yourself yeah and that's and it's because we're doing it to ourselves and what we do to others we're doing to ourselves and so i mean my Riffing off what you were saying, my sense of evil relates very closely and strongly to the distortion of reality, reality distortion. And that was what I felt was going on with Lavender, and it was crazy making. He was distorting reality around Crowley and, he, and spinning it this way and that to try and, it wasn't just to win an argument, like I've seen that behavior, you know, I know when someone's trying to win an argument, it's kind of easy to deal with, but this was much slipperier. He was trying to actually maintain a version of reality that was false and to make me think that I was wrong not to win the argument, but to just undermine my sense of what was true and what was real. That was my sense of what was going on, even though it was kind of an occult perception ma management, like a very skilled practitioner of perception management, which of course is what you know occultism and magic is closely related to, manipulating reality by manipulating people's perceptions. Let me ask you to back up a little bit set up the story a little bit, a little bit of the background, and then walk people through the exchange with Lavenda, who is Lavenda, and then how the exchange kind of builds, because it almost has a, a tempo, like a story in and of itself. Right. 
Well, I so I knew Lavender. I talked to him for Stormy Weather back in 2009. Tell folks, who is Peter Lavender? Well, Lavender, very well known for Sinister Forces trilogy. Uh, before that, he wrote a book on Nazism that Norman Mailer provided a foreword for. Uh, and he's more recently written these books about Lovecraft and UFOs with Tom DeLonge. He's written books about Kenneth Grant also. So he's had a long and, quote, illustrious, unquote, career. He's also got this shadowy side to it. As Before you get to the shadowy side, I mean, yeah, again, yeah. For, the, for, the, for just the kind of average person, Peter yeah. Lavenda is one of us, right? He's out there in this kind of alt conspiracy thing telling you giving you the goods on jfk and writing about sinister cope forces and these crazy people and peter lavenda is one of us and then mm. you know he comes along with the it, it, lo and lo and behold he pops up with the tom DeLong thing and his story is well you know the phone rang and it was Tom DeLong and I said, Tom DeLong, it can't be. And I hung up the phone. And then he called me back and he said, Yes, it really is Tom DeLong from Blink 182. And Peter, we have to get to the bottom of this UFO thing. And Peter goes, Yeah, you're right, Tom. We should go to the CIA and get the real story. So Peter Lavenda represents, if people don't know, he represents this kind of one of us conspiracy alt you know, narrative guy, he's on our side, right? Which makes this exchange that you have with them about Crowley a million times more interesting. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah, he's, he's probably one of the three or four central figures or has been in the, in the alternate perceptions community, a conspiracy authors and so on. Right up there. I, I actually was never that impressed by Sinister Forces and I wasn't sure why. I just didn't feel it could, somehow. It just felt like a, a shopping list of, you know, of data. Uh, so it felt lifeless. But I did have good conversations with Lavender, and he's clearly a very smart guy. Um, the last time I spoke to him on the limo list, I did bring out the. Po the possibility that he was an intelligence operative, but not as a question. I, I, I couched it in such a way that I, you know, it was safe for both of us, but just that, you know, have you ever been asked that you're an intelligence operative? Because there's an awful lot of, you know, weird things around your life. But anyway, that, that, you know, that was as close as I got to a direct confrontation until this happened, this, this thread. And this happened, uh, you know, innocently and organically enough, just, because I was researching Crowley and these possible things, and that I was reaching out to a number of people, and Lavender seemed an obvious person. So I sent him an email just bringing up this, you know, have you ever considered this possibility that Crowley might evolve? Okay, again, I'm going to have to drag you through this backstory. In your, it's your work, okay? So all credit to you, Jason. But the backstory is that if you start looking at the weaponized, systematic, abuse of children in our culture, what that might mean for politics, what that might mean in terms of uh, power, and, and then this extended part of it that you don't really get into too much, these extended realms. Crowley is somebody who kind of starts coming in through, in some weird ways, you know, that you just wouldn't expect. And then if you look at, like you did, the scholars, the Crowley scholars, they really come up in a very kind of apologetics kind of, he wasn't that bad, you don't really understand him kind of thing. And Peter Lavenda, what do you th where would you stake him in that, in that kind of plethora of uh, quote unquote Crowley scholars? Where, where does he stand and why did you reach out to him? Well, I mean, he's not technically a Crowley scholar. I mean, he hasn't written about Crowley very directly, but he has written a whole book about Kenneth Grant, who was Crowley's successor. And of course, he's written a lot about occultism in Sinister Forces. There's a whole trilogy about Sinister Forces and the overlap with occultism and intelligence agencies. So it's his field. It's absolutely his field. Like one of the things that's been uh, kind of tossed around is this idea of whether Crowley himself was involved with 
sexual molestation, sexual abuse, sex magic with little kids. So that's what you probed him on, right? That's what I probed him on. And there was a larger question with occultism in general, you know, how much of an overlap was there with occultism and the sexual abuse of children, whether or not it was institutionalized and systematized by these intelligence operations that I've been tracking and which Lavenda himself had supposedly been tracking also. Right, so he just seemed an obvious person to go to, uh, and I knew him. Now, his his tack was, first of all, to defend Crowley, or at least suggest that I was barking up the wrong tree because there was no real evidence to suggest anything of the kind for Crowley. He just talked a lot about stuff, and that was, you know, people always took him to literally that kind of angle of approach, which I was already familiar with. Hold on, though, because we, we, we got, I mean, I don't know if I'm messing this up by interrupting you all the time, but you're, okay. you're just, you're breezing past all these fantastic points. And the first yeah. one is, is right there, is that it's almost like a freaking playbook, Jason. So the first, the first is kind of this patronizing tone that comes through in these emails, like, kid, you don't know what you're talking about. So you just, you just need to back up because you, you just don't know what you're talking about, right? That's the first line of, I'm Peter Lavenda. You're a guy who reached out to me. I get a ton of these emails. Kid, why don't you just move on, right? It was. I mean, that was the feeling. That was what I said earlier on. It was a little hard to gauge how much I was reacting a bit neurotically because of my own issues with father or older, but you know, that, how much of it I was projecting, you can never be sure. And that's part of the very skillful, you know, psychological handling of someone. And by the end, you know, jumping to the end, I really felt like I was ha handled by Lavender, like by a master. To the contrary, I thought you handled him better than anyone I've seen. Because again, we can go through these emails, but it's probably too much to do on this show. But there's round after round where you say, well, wait a minute, right from his own diaries, here are his admissions that he diddled his words, Crowley's words, children. Here is his acknowledgement that he allowed children to be present ver during, at least be present, if not involved in these sex magic rituals, if we're to call them that. So you're hitting him with fact after fact that is directly, thoroughly referenced in his work. And his deflections are more and more telling of kind of a desperate attempt to get you to buy into this narrative that just doesn't hold. Mm. Well, you know, I wonder how much this is because there's been a sea change in the years since then, because when that discussion first happened and I, and I, put it online with Lavender's permission, which kind of seems surprising in retrospect. There were certainly people saying, oh, you came, Lavender came off much better than you did. And you, you know, basically, and that they didn't feel that they were just Lavender's lackeys either. You know, it was even people that followed my blog. It, it definitely it was, definitely wasn't the unanimous feeling. And I didn't feel at the end of it, like I'd scored a victory. I, I just, I wasn't even sure what had happened to be honest. So that's what I mean by handle. I felt psychologically I'd been manipulated quite a lot. And yes, I thought I was definitely making persuasive argument and he was doing exactly what you're saying, but I couldn't be sure if others were able to see that. And it wasn't clear that they had. I mean, this is... Well, that's a whole other level to this thing that, that we could kind yeah. of talk about because the edge that you're, I love how you said before, you know, the thin edge <laughs> and the thin edge that you're playing, is, it, it's never going to be popular. Never, and people are never going to, you know, in droves flock to Jason Horsley and go, oh, wow, he totally nailed it. I mean, it's so much of a paradigm shift for people. But I think that where where you're really at is playing for the very thin minority of people who really see it for what it is. Because when I read that post, I immediately saw it for what it is. And it just further cemented these suspicions I had had because Peter Lavenda did appear to me like so many of these CIA lifetime players who, as you explain in another excellent post on your website, use 95% truth and 5 to 
orchestrated narrative, controlled narrative in order to shape the story. And, you know, I don't know if we want to dive into that right away or if we want to go in a different direction, but, you know, how effective you can be with 90 to 95% just true, agree with you and win your trust so that I can then use that to kind of switch things in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's spin, isn't it? And my sense with that, with, with Lavender, and he did help me see something, uh, you know, ironically, is, is that I started to get a sense that it was to do with ideological affiliation, if you like, that, that Lavender, in my, in my impression anyway, is, is ideologically affiliated with the occult values and systems and methodologies that Crowley himself was a pioneer of. And so he can dodge this and that by saying he's never been a Crowley advocate and, and, and so on. But he's perpetuating the same memes. And I think that that's what essentially he was defending. But what would uh, that ideology be? I, see, I think people struggle with that. It's like, yeah. okay, he appears to be having some agenda that we have traditionally historically aligned with a certain group of U.S. intelligence agents that are driving a certain agenda. But I think this is, again, where it gets into the evil thing. We, for the most part, have associated that agenda with, with evil, with, you know, deception, with the secret overthrow of governments, of secret pacts and societies that others aren't aware of. So, I don't know what ideology you're, what other ideology you're referring to, but that's generally not an ideology that most of us think of as a, as something good. Sure, no, it's it's really is complicated. I mean, we're getting into really deep waters here because I mean, there's two. I I see there's like there's two things going on here. One is an ideology that is almost revealable. I think, which is the talking about intelligence agencies and stuff, they have an ideology and it's still a cover. First of all, they have the, the, the first cover, which is that they're the good guys and they would never do any of that kind of stuff, right? Underneath that, once you start seeing that that's bullshit, they have this second ideology, the second layer, which is we are the good guys, but we have to do evil stuff in order to, to fight evil. We have to be as evil as the people we're fighting. So, you want me on that wall, you need me on that wall thing. Yeah. Yes, and so, so, so there's that, and, and that's pretty persuasive. I mean, it's pretty hard, hard to argue against that. And one could see how, for example, if Lavender really did believe Tom DeLonge's f f fantasy a a alien invasion, that there's these evil Lovecraftian overlords that want to completely destroy us, uh, then that would justify any kind of human skullduggery and, and, and you know evil doing if it would prevent that from happening right so that so that's the second layer underneath that i believe this is the thing that we're not supposed to see unless we're ready um and that would be either ready to be recruited or ready to be just completely supplicant to it because we're so you know pacified and horrified by it is that they are they the human beings the intelligence operatives or the occult agents of control are our overlords, whether or not they really have connected, you know, to the Cthulhu or whether or not they really believe it. And that they practice an ideological methodology which has to do with trauma genesis, which is engineering or accelerating evolution through the infliction of violence and trauma, specifically on children. And that they're creating this great cosmic omelette that involves breaking all of these eggs in order to do it. And that, I mean, you find that, you can see that intersection with Kenneth Grant, for example, that there's a new stage of evolution coming on this planet and that the human form has to be destroyed in order. I mean, that, that's consistent through many different myths, uh, including transhumanism, right? We're, we're transcending to another level beyond flesh and blood. So, so that's the ideology I'm talking about. That the all uh, this end justifies all means and even requires the worst means possible. Well, again, I think that's super important, but super deep. But I think it's really key how you layered those ideologies because I 
I think I'm pretty much in sync with you. You know, level one is the way I put it is you don't deserve the truth, you know, which is like, I'm going to lie to you because if you're stupid enough to believe my lies, then you're just, you don't matter. And then level two is you can't handle the truth. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. And the third layer, I think, relates back to what you said very early on, which I think is super key, is that ultimately a spiritual self-deception. It's mm -hmm. a buying into this spiritual materialism that I can gain. I can somehow accomplish an escape from my dilemma, from my existential dilemma. By transhumanism, I can live forever. Or just by dominating everybody, I can kind of control everything. And of course, I think in our deep, deep inside of us, we understand how futile that is because we're up against that truth that we all know, which is that, you know, we're not going to escape this. You know, it isn't going to turn out the way that we want, no matter how we think, because it's not about doing, accomplishing, gathering, and feeding that little me that I've created. So I think the three layers that you have there uh, kind of explain a lot. And I don't get too hung up on the, all the permutations of layer threes that people can get, you know, transhumanism versus sex abuse of children versus, you know, this occult thing. I mean, it's, it's limitless. And I think we can kind of lose the thread by tracing down, you know, where does that one lead? Where does that one lead? They all lead to the same place. It's just a self-deception. Mm. Yeah, well, I would tend to agree with you there. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to give up writing books. I'm trying to <laughs> at least start writing about different things. This is the last one, Maps of Hell, is this idea, you know, okay, this is mapping hell, but uh, the only point or reason to map hell is to, is to find the exit of how, how we came in, how we ended up here, and that would be the way out too. And once you've done that, you leave, you just stop mapping it. So yeah, there's a there's a fundamental reality to existence which transcends morality, we could say, but it's the source of morality, and and it's it's so accessible to us because it's the nature and fabric of, of physical reality itself. But of course, we are in this dissociated realm through this sustained, perpetuated trauma, and um, there are many many red herrings on the path back to the truth. So. To some extent, we don't have much choice but to map the, you know, the ramifications and the, the iterations of delusion. I haven't anyway. Um, and, I, but, and I do think they all come back to this reality of distortion. Like these three levels, they're all about the distortion of reality and, and how when we, when we are committed to distorting reality, not, not only do we justify any level of abuses, but they become necessary. Because anyone who, who touches upon our experience uh, with a, a breath of the real or remind us, reminds us of reality or questions our distortions has to be either destroyed, banished, or as you put it, you know, co-opted and, and sucked into our delusional state. So we, I mean, so we become destructive in that way as, a, as an over, you know, overcharged self-protective strategy that just replicates and replicates. You know, I thought I might pick up a little bit on your point about staring into the abyss, because we do have this sense, I think, and it's told to us in a number of different ways in terms of our culture. You know, don't look at evil, you know, don't stare into evil and you will become evil. And there's a certain reality that we get that and we see people who do become consumed by that which they study and it kind of becomes a part of them. But I don't know. I, I certainly don't get that from your work. I get that. I get that you're moving through it. I don't, I don't feel like you're stopping any longer than you need to, to, you know, really explore what it's there because there's another danger. And that is what I see is the looking away from evil without regard for how that shadow may be manifested deep inside of us and how it may be infecting you know the rest of our culture so 
I don't know. I don't worry too much about staring into the abyss as long as we're grounded on the the way out, which is always, I think, just to look up. We don't have to, we don't have to go there. We can switch the, to, at any point. You know, you can listen to the podcast. You can turn it off and go walk on the beach. You can, you know, turn off the TV. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, so this is back to the nub of, of, of evil and the frame of evil, because it can be, I mean, this is a C.S. Lewis quote, which I thought was great, which is um, the demons have two ways of, of controlling us one is to you know get us to just dismiss them as unreal and the other is is to uh, engender an unhealthy obsession with their existence and and so certainly there are those who just dismiss evil as as, a, as an outdated moralistic you know religious perspective and they uh, you know you can't really do that except by not digging deep enough because if you dig deep enough you'll see that there's you know that there are things going on in our world and even in our towns that are just so horrific that we really do need to use that word and we don't need have to use it but it, that word has meaning evil does have a know it when i see it kind of quality that's inescapable for for all of us. And I think that's almost like a starting point in in a way, as horrific as those things are, it's almost like a grounding to say, oh yeah, uh, there is something that I do understand as evil. Any spectrum, you know, has has extremes, any polarity. If we accept there's a wholesome goodness to life, then there, there could be a state where that is almost completely absent. So, so it's to do with an awareness of our capacity and our limits and, you know, and this all has to do with this question, right, you know, how much are we willing to look at? And my, my understanding, and it seems logical to me, is we have to be willing to look at everything. You know, if you think of the human body and it's got some sort of, you know, conditions or pathologies or what have you, uh, not wanting to look at any of those particular things, particularly the worst ones, is obviously going to be counterproductive. The worse it is, the more we need to look at it. The thing is, is not to recoil in horror. And that's, you know, and, and that's the flip side of, you know, people, evil has a fascination. And I'd say the fascination is probably compensatory and goes back very far and deep. I think about fairy tales. Fairy tales are written for children with all this horrific imagery because it's understood that childhood is horrifying. There are things that happen to us as children or that we start to perceive that horrify us. And so fairy tales provide a certain amount of relief from that. But they also potentially, you know, are dissociative fantasies that might feed a fascination for, for evil or for trauma. And so we're in this world where, as I said with Crowley, you can see two sides. You can see that there are all these generations of people who are fascinated by Crowley and all he represents and all that's kind of spewed out of the Crowley apparatus. And on the other hand, and it isn't just Christian, as I say, but you've got, uh, and it probably is often a more wholesome perspective and certainly more accurate, that that's just toxic. And, 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 and polluted and, and basically evil, so stay away from it. Um, but they're not willing, I mean, that perspective isn't willing to understand. It just wants to dismiss. And so what I found is what works for me is actually, and that this to me is the acid test, is can I look at the worst things that I can find in my own life, in my body, in my psyche, in my past, in my own behaviors, and in the culture that I've adopted and, and uh, unwittingly propagated, like a virus, spread it, can I look at those things and not only not turn away, but not react, right? And it's very close to judge, not lest you be judged, but it's not, judgment isn't bad, in it, so it's not that I'm not discerning, I'm not saying, I'm not judging in the sense I can judge and say, I judge this to be toxic and harmful. That's a judgment, but it's not a judgment like a condemnation. Like I could never do that or that's not, not part of me. It's the opposite. It's like that I have that in me, you know, as one cell in the whole body of humanity, that is, is part of my, you know, my, my existence. Can I actually, can I, um, I'm trying to say embrace, but then we get onto this, 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 
dangerous line of transgression. So it's certainly not embrace and sense of celebrate, but it's embrace and sense of integrate. I can actually just let it be there so that my, the goodness of my system as a whole system will be able to absorb it. Yeah. I think that's incredibly deep and it's completely consistent with my spirituality, which is that uh, what it's really about here without, and this is, I'll probably edit this out because it's a little bit too prescriptive. Like I don't have, I don't know the fucking mind of God. And, you know, I certainly, I don't even know half of what I understand, half of what I read, but what seems to make sense to me is that the light ultimately shines and that what we're experiencing is a blockage of that light and that the best way to it's an addition by subtraction thing, which is kind of what I hear you saying with the integration. It's yeah. letting the light do its thing, which Very is simple. just, you don't have to do, you don't have to do anything. You just have to disengage and it'll self-correct. Let me, let me play some more clips from your excellent podcast, because I think, I think you'll have a lot to say just, by re-listening to these again. Well, the first thing I heard or read or let in was, was Crowley's Book of the Law. And it did, it uplifted me. I, I believed right away that I was prophesied in that book. And so after I read Book of the Law, you could say I embraced Philema. I felt like I was the, the successor to Crowley. And I'm talking to you about this now. I honestly don't know at this point how much, if, if, if there was any truth in that, and if so, how much, because I don't, I, I, I'm wary of throwing babies out with bathwater. There's an awful lot of bathwater and there's an awful lot of dead babies in our culture. Love that line. All I know for sure is that Crowley was the worst kind of role model and whatever came through him, whatever possible truth there was in it, it would be like water coming through a rusty contaminated pipe that had had been hadn't been used since the the Black Death, right? So it's still the water might might have been clear once upon a time, but once it's come out the other end of that pipe it's just toxic. That's how I feel about Crowley now. And that's based on a number of things that I recount in Vice of Kings, the two main areas, I suppose, my own life, like I, I put my own life under the microscope in terms of Crowley's influence and how I emulated Crowley to the point, for example, of committing an animal sacrifice without realizing that I'd done so, which would raise a question mark for your listeners, but that's how unconscious it can be if we get colonized by you know a toxic philosophy and and many other ways i mean tattoos and things like of this kind i mean i really just took on the, the crowleyanity in a deep way without really believing i was doing so i thought i was just as i say picking up where he left off so I, so i look at that and the other thing i look at is crowley's life and all of the evidence for not just the malevolent nature of Crowley himself and of his behaviors and his abuses of power, self-abuses and I believe abuses of others, but also his compatibility with or his alignment with the dominant superculture, by which I mean it's a hidden culture that rules over this culture. <laughs> well, there's a lot to unpack there. Fantastic. What are your thoughts listening to it again? Well, gosh, like I said, there's just, there's just a lot. I mean, I guess I'm just having more of a personal res response, which is, you know, how, 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 how in the clear am I? How, how close to the exit am I of that, that hellish cultural programming? How close are we all? Um, cause what, are, what are your thoughts when, when you say that? And because I'm always a little bit, suspicious of the cultural overlay i mean it's so it's so oppressive especially like right now with what we're going through but at the same time it feels like you know back to the three layers it feels like a head fake it's like that's not what it's about that's not what it's about it's just another form of deception where are you at with that 
What What do you mean? What's another form of deception? Well, to like a minute ago, we were talking about the personal spirituality of evil and the integration. So however it forms, whether it's a little evil we have or whether it's a big evil and it comes up and we deal with it by letting go of it, just letting it merge back in, you know? Mm -hmm. And I totally, I think that's really, really deep from a personal spiritual standpoint. I get the cultural part, you know, I get it every day. And every time I turn on the computer or turn on the fire cube, the Amazon fire cube. But then I also wonder if sometimes that feels like I'm being pulled into this spiritual materialism again, where I need to square off with Peter Lavenda because he's trying to control the narrative and let's go get those freaking Catholic priests because they're deceiving us. When, to your point gotcha. before, the deception is always only a self-deception. Yeah. Yeah, so I think what I mean in my response there is, is that uh, certainly not about blaming the culture or, or identifying the cause of, of, of my distortions in the culture, except so far as it's a mirror. And, and there, is, there is a causative as well as a correlative element. I was once a child and I was encultured in a way that was traumatic and so on. So, and that's helpful to my own... Uh, integration process or my becoming conscious process is to see those things but certainly no it's not about the culture bad you know back to nature although i'm kind of feeling that orientation currently um it, again it's about how how closely are we willing to look at the culture to see what i call the superculture because you know most of the analyses if you can even call them that but the growing perspective i mean there's something weird whatever's going on in the world now and a lot of it we get through the internet but um there's two two things i want to mention that are going on in the culture now one is we could say the quanon thing or whatever you know just to just to give a you know a pin it uh, an identification point but the growing awareness of the toxicity of our culture and of the hidden machinations of power abuse and all of that and the other is is um harder to define but um and and it also has a kind of anti it's an anti-patriarchal feeling but it, it it's to do with identity politics and the celebration of the self uh, over everything else right and and you know safe zones and 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 hate speech and political correctness and you know that whole thing right and uh they're both aspects of the culture of course and i think that they're both traps and um they 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 converge in an interesting way because the problem with what i call the quanon thing or the just the, the you know the growing awareness of of the toxicity of the culture that wants to identify name and expunge the evil within our culture is that it is it is scapegoating and it's not really identifying how deep the problem goes it's it's, it's mistaking an effect for a cause as in if our country is i mean our, our world is is mostly run by a cacistocracy aristocracy i think is the word you know by 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 pathological predators that's more of a symptom of something much deeper than it is the cause of it so that that I don't think is ever going to work. Just trying to actually um, fix it by addressing the surface, um, and then on the other hand, this celebration of the identity clearly is itself a symptom of of, of you know this Crowley Crowley uh, kind of will to power, pursuit of happiness, will to power. You know they're they're almost different. Uh, descriptions of the same urge, I think, which is the reification of the identity and our own personal drives over everything. So the point I'm trying to make here is, is that um, if we were, if we start to really identify what's going on in the culture in a way that's more comprehensive and less reactive, um, we'll see two things. One, we'll start to see just, just how bad things really are across the board and that it's in absolutely everything. It's, it is like a virus or plutonium or something. It doesn't 
just hit certain individuals or certain populations. It's it's throughout everything, and and by extension, it's in us. So the more we see how bad things are culturally and socially, the more we're going to see. If we're honestly looking, the more we're going to see how we're carriers of it, and that leaves us nowhere to go, actually, because you can't. Then you can't say let's have a revolution because you you have to admit you can create the revolution and take out the power structures, but you will just build them in in the image of the thing you've taken down. So it takes us to a place of a really really difficult place, and it is a spiritual place. It is consistent with religious doctrine. I was going to try and pick up on your your really excellent point about those two forces. I don't generally like to get too political because it just kind of, I mean, there's so many different ways to trigger people. I'd rather trigger them on more important things that they haven't thought about before, like Alistair Crowley, than trigger them on QAnon, which is just like an instant, you know, no stop, boom, right to the end of the line kind of thing. But I I think your point is super well taken about, and and if we were going to try and fold that into this conversation, I'd have to kind of wonder uh, out loud to you whether or not that orchestrated divisiveness isn't just another play in the playbook. You know, it's the, it's kind of two ways to stir up the natives. And so we have the Crowleyism do what thou wilt on one hand, and you'll have the, you know, grab the pitchforks. We just have to get these bastards on the other hand, and that's what you want. You just want them fighting and you want them depressed and confused and they're just easier to control that way. You don't want them thinking deeply about things or existential questions and you certainly don't want them somehow uniting on some humanitarian, deeply human sensibilities that we would say approach spirituality. You you just, you definitely don't want that. That's not good for business. Yeah, well, it's um, it also prevents mapping what's going on. It prevents coherence because you've got, you've got these two extremes and they're not meeting. It's like C.S. Lewis with the demons as well. You know, the truth isn't that demons don't exist. The truth isn't that demons are super all-powerful and need to be worshipped or, or feared even, right? It's the truth is somewhere bringing these two perspectives together um, and what you're talking about there, I, I've written about that in the um, on my blog, but it's also in 16 Maps of Hell. Schismogenesis was the thing that Gregory Bateson developed while he was working for the OSS. And we're really seeing the evidence of it now. It's, it is divide and conquer, but it's to do uh, at the most subtle levels as well with perspectives and, and with grouping. So, yeah, what you're describing there, that Intensified polarization means it's harder and harder to find a position anywhere in the middle, the space between, right? The, that becomes less and less populated and the, the, the magnetic pull of the two poles gets stronger and stronger. So, so now if you don't want to be seen as a trump eye or a mag eye or whatever, then you've got to double down on your you know, liberal progressivism. Otherwise, right, you've got to have a strong opinion about something because one way or another, you'll get grouped on one side or the other. And there's a tendency to want to gravitate because it's very scary to be in the middle and potentially you get scapegoated by both sides, right? So, and that happens internally as well. We, we, st- we start going prematurely to strong convictions on one side or the other rather than staying in this ambiguity about, you know, is it? And that's bring it back to Lavenda. That was one of the tells really, because I was, I was questioning, I was asking questions and it seemed that he was shutting down the questioning. Right? And, and that's, that's always been my approach. And I think that that's the healthiest and the sanest approach. Um, to be constantly asking questions and if the questions keep leading you closer and closer to to some kind of reality you don't ever have to to finalize it and put a stamp on it and say that's it now I know that evil exists and it looks like this that and the other as to Crowley and the OTO or whatever uh, one does, because then one stops questioning 
but you, you, you map and you mark as you go. Okay, so I've identified those agents, but you know, there's still more to uncover. We don't know by the end of it, it everything could look completely different, of course. But in the meantime, we see more and more about what we haven't seen. Whenever I talk to someone and they, they're quick to say, oh, oh no, I don't doubt, I, I, I'm a Christian, I don't doubt my faith. Mm -hmm. you, you've lost the spiritual edge. You, you, you are a, a con the person who says, oh, that's the Zen mind, uh, beginner mind, you know, like I'm always beginning, I'm always wondering, I'm always challenging on my beliefs. There seems to be something fundamentally spiritual about that. And especially when we contrast it with the opposite of that, which is belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually did a blog post recently. It was called The Vector of Increasing Disbelief, which spells void. And we just have to keep moving into this void where we, we disbelieve. But we allow ourselves to, con to, to look at the non-confirming evidence, not just looking at the evidence that confirms. And even if there's just a little bit, and it, it is, it's incredibly hard, Alex. And I mean, you talked about the very specifics of, um, you know, Lavender, and that was one of the hardest experiences in, you know, my work writing is actually confronting a, another deception and not knowing what to believe. And, but it continues to this day. I mean, so working in this field as we do, we often don't know, are we speaking with somebody who's genuinely what they, they say they are? And, and, and how do you approach that? You have to stay in this liminal place. You don't believe them and you don't take them at their word entirely because then you just get, and you don't, you know, to be overly polite and, and just keep to the protocol. If you see bullshit, you have to call it. But at the same time, you don't start shouting that they're a shill and that they're this, that and the other, because then you've lost your own footing, your own ground. Uh, and that, you know, that's just a microcosm of this much larger thing. We're in, we're in a time in history of society, what have you, where everything is increasingly unstable and liminal. And then we're in this vast universe where it's all unknown. And then, it, then we're in eternity where we're completely at a loss to make sense of anything. So, and, and this is actually you know, to a meta point. This is one of the the levels of deception is this mixing of levels. So you'll find this moral relativism around things, which uses the level of cosmic, say cosmic or spiritual awareness to say, well, there is no good and evil. It's all one, it's all gone, it's all God. But they're applying it to the, the, the social level of, of raping and killing children, not directly, but indirectly. And, and in some cases, directly. <laughs> in some cases, directly or close enough, you can join the dots. And, and then they're hypocrites and liars with maybe deep rationalization and delusion behind it. But some level, often there's a conscious, there's also, there's also just a conscious malevolence going on there. So, you but, know, yeah. well, I'm returning more and more to this idea of we're all just here to entertain each other. And I heard that quote from Shirley MacLaine, who if anyone remembers way back in the 70s, was the first really big celebrity to kind of launch the New Age movement and talk, talk about astral projection. And I heard this interview with her, and the guy was really kind of looking to, I guess, incite some kind of reaction about all the abuse she took, because she took so much abuse for being this kind of New Age person. And she was like, look, you know, detractors, whatever. We're all just trying to entertain each other. We're all, we're all maybe just here to entertain each other. And, you know, I thought about that the other day because someone was bringing up like Michael Shermer, the skeptic, and I've had him on the show a bunch of times. And I don't think he does very well at all, but I, I, I like his, as a frenemy, he's great. He's entertaining. Or Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is kind of a, a nitwit when it comes to consciousness and says absurd things, kind of like with Sam Harris, kind of same thing. But they are entertaining. And, and I think we have to genuinely, I think, appreciate how all our, our, our enemies slash frenemies are somehow part of this process of entertainment. What do you think? Is there anything to that? Well, I think there's some, I mean, the, the, the kernel in there, I'd say, is, is that we can find ways to 
see what is is good and the value of others and appreciate their particular qualities i'd say entertaining is not a word that i would use because it it's just, it means passing the time and i think we're definitely here to do more than pass that the time because are really we really though are we see that, this gets back to the it gets back to the three levels and it's like if they're convincing you that you're here to do something other than pass time Maybe that's part of the deception as well, because maybe all yeah, we're so here. That's, level, that's levels again. But I mean, I'm not enlightened. So, and I mean, the only person I know who seems like they are enlightened, he seems very dedicated to to helping other human beings. I'm highly suspicious of that. I just am. And I, I tell you a great story. I, I, I love spiritual story is um, Ama. You know, Ama, the hugging saint. She's quite popular. Yeah, among, I know about among dual. So, so I went and saw Ama in LA and I got a hug from Ama. Didn't do anything for me. Yeah. But I appreciate where she's coming from. And I appreciate the story that I heard from my buddy Rick Archer from Buddha at the Gas Pump that a devotee came up to Ama and said, uh, you know, you speak of this world as non-existent and yet i see you out working 18 hours a day digging latrines in the hunt with the untouchables and hugging people till you're almost to the point of exhaustion how how what is it about this world and she goes world what world and if we take that story all those spiritual stories as being somewhat true it's someone who doesn't even see their actions as doing in a literal sense. And I'm highly suspicious of spiritual materialism is what I call it. The sage on the stage, the I know something special and let me just pass it on to you. But then you have to get out there and buddy, you got to do it because doing oh, sure. is what's important. Sure. I mean, we, but this is quite a big subject now. We're just veering into it and it's quite, quite far from what we've been covering so i'll, I'll bring it back to entertainment because because i said it's key to this latest book about hollywood and there's a there's a convergence between entertainment certainly in the hollywood sense and uh, suspending disbelief that's the, the first principle the prime directive of hollywood right and you could say of entertainment we have to suspend disbelief so that we get pulled into the story and and believe that it's real so um my sense is with i mean entertainment has its place and certainly i want to enjoy my conversation with you otherwise what's the point i have to wonder jason when i saw your mind go there for a minute i wonder if you saw the same connection that i did and that if if entertainment in hollywood is about suspending disbelief and we are here to inquiry to perpetuate doubt. Isn't mm -hmm. there an interesting through line between those two that, that maybe we have to explore yeah. in the disbelief that you talked about in your blog post, which I haven't yeah, read by the way, which sounds great. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. So I would say that we you and I are here, our mission, if you like, is to unsuspend disbelief. So in that sense, it's anti-entertainment. We're trying to get free of the spell of entertainment and that it would be much better, wouldn't it, for me to be able to be as honest with you as I, as I could be, even if that meant that you were no longer being entertained. You might get upset, you might get offended, but the truth is much more important than keeping each other happy. <laughs> well, yeah, except we could, we could, you know, suspend disbelief and suspending belief are the same. Right. So if I'm trying right. to. Right. No, yes. they're not. Spending disbelief it, means believing. It's just a fancy way of saying believing. Well, it depends on what your beliefs are. So you take one I mean, belief and I'm going to try and get you to but, suspend that um, belief as a just, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a but, double negative when we say suspend and dis. I mean, it's. Okay. But you understand the meaning in Hollywood. It means that you, you uh, inhibit the part of your consciousness that's telling you this is not real. None of this is happening. You inhibit that. You suspend your disbelief so that you succumb to the spell and you feel like you're actually having a real experience. That, that's what we do all the time during our days. When we interact with each other, we forget that 
we're not who we think we are and that what we're seeing and perceiving isn't really what's happening. Even if we know, you know, in different ways we know that reality is, is quite different than our minds are telling it it is. We, part of what, how our minds do it is they persuade us. They're these wizards of, wizard of Oz's, you know. You, you know, there's this really fantastic podcast that I like. It's been around forever. It's called Martini Shot with Rob Long, who was a, is a, a very highly, highly regarded writer in Hollywood and used to write for, uh, oh, what was that show? Uh, Cheers, you know, way back in the day. And he's done a m many other projects as well. But he always has this kind of insider kind of Hollywood writer's thing. But, you know, to drive home your point about suspending disbelief, I love this story that he tells about this one scene that they were shooting and they shot it and they liked it. And then somebody pointed out that the actor who, you know, this is sitcom, TV sitcom kind of stuff, not high cinema or anything, but he never started the car and yet drove off in it. You know what I mean? Right. And this guy brought it up, said, hey, you know, we got to reshoot that because, you know, people are going to pick up on that. And he yeah. said, if they pick up on that, we've already lost already. Yeah. And it speaks to the suspending disbelief. If we haven't gotten them along to go along with the story at this point, then forget it. They're not there. So I guess I I'd, I'd wonder out loud, and this is kind of a very minor point, but it's maybe interesting. If this entertainment that we're doing for and to each other isn't playing with these different ideas of belief and trying to tune up my belief with yours and whether you want to call it disbelief or belief, it's kind of two, two sides of the same coin. I think it probably has to do with what's primary. I think if our, if our, if our primary drive or interest is, is getting to the truth and really being as real as we can with each other, uh, and our, the entertainment thing is secondary, then all is good and all is well. But if think if we put the entertainment thing primary and then we, we subject or submit the, the truth impetus to that and say, well, if at any point my search for the truth ceases to be entertaining, I'll stop it, right? Then, then we get into problems. You know, with Lavender, if I'd been, if I had put entertainment before truth, I would have, Gone, it would have gone a very different way because it wasn't entertaining. That was not an entertaining exchange. It was for others, I'm finding out now, in the end. But even at the time, it made people uncomfortable. So, so I couldn't well say that that was motivated by entertainment. It was motivated by something else. And that it could be borderline neurotic, as I say. Like the drive for the truth can be unhealthy. It can be, it can be obsessive. Your other point, which is extremely well taken. And, and it's these subtle shifts that we make in terms of how we're prioritizing all these different things and keeping the space and keeping the plates spinning is yeah. is really what it's all about. So yeah. I, I, I give up on that one. You wrestled me to the ground and, and okay. I, I agree with you. Okay. You, you know, one, okay. one final point I might try and fold back into this because I really tried to, I jumped in there and kind of really put those halts on when you talked about religion. And I guess I want to deconstruct that a little bit. So we're not just talking in shorthand, but like one of the really influential episodes or explorations I did on Skeptico was the series of interviews I did with Joseph Atwell, who is, the, wrote this book, Caesar's Messiah, that the premise of the book is that there is the, the Jesus myth, the historical Jesus doesn't really exist and should be under, is best understood as a social control mechanism of the Roman Empire. And I don't agree with the 100% go there kind of thing that Joe Atwell does, but I think there's some fundamental provable truths to what he's about. And historically, if anyone wants to investigate, I always point people to Josephus, because Josephus is the, what, what we're told is Josephus is this Roman slash Jewish historian through which we know just about everything historically that we know about that time. 
Atwell makes an extremely strong case for the fact that Josephus is a fictional character. He's not real. He's an invention of the Roman Empire to control the narrative. And the evidence, I think, is really, once you can make that step, it becomes really kind of overwhelming evidence from everything about Josephus' story. But the implications of that in terms of the Bible are much more significant because the writings of Josephus, which are clearly pro-Roman because the Romans employed this guy to write the history, are, are clearly uh, constructed in, in, the, in the Gospels. So jo the, the Gospels, the Bible, is dependent on Josephus. Josephus is written into the Bible. The implications of this are that it is undeniable that Christianity, as we understand it, was from the beginning, to some extent, a control mechanism, a social engineering mechanism, just like it is today, and that that's always been at play. And to broaden it to this larger conversation we're having, what I think people have a problem with, that doesn't mean that Christ consciousness isn't real. That doesn't mean that people can't experience some kind of spiritual truth, both through that book, through the figures in that book, in the same way that they can experience some negative reality to Satan, even though our, our, our friend Richard Smoley, historian, points out that Satan, it slips through our fingers historically as well. So until we can get to that deeper reality about exploring how these, how these can both be true, then I don't think we can get there. But I certainly don't think we need to infuse religion back into this discussion, Christianity back into this discussion, as if it's somewhat, as if it's real in some sense, because it's, it's, just, it's just not in that way real to talk about it, you know? Well, no, not really, um, and because we are talking about evil, and so I'd say the context for evil is largely a religious one. Uh, and the point I made about religious What if doctrine, it's not? What, what if it's not? What if it's, because I, I think, I thought we were saying it's not a religious one. I thought we were saying, you know. Uh, well, I think, I mean, this is a point that Jordan Peterson makes. I'm not a very fan of Jordan Peterson, but I think it was one of his better points is that we are Christian whether we like it or not. Our culture is so firmly embedded in the Christian ethos that even the staunchest atheists don't realize that they're espousing Christian values. Yeah, but that's cripplingly ethnocentric. You know, I just posted on, on the Skeptical Forum, this is just like recent news, 27 people dead in New Guinea because they were suspected of being witches. So part of the culture had this spiritual connection with this other dimension and decided that these people were witches and that they needed to die and they killed them and they ate their hearts and cooked their penis or something crazy like that. Or maybe it's not crazy. Maybe that is what happened in, in the extended realm. Maybe there's a demon in that extended realm that's manipulating them in the same way that Montezuma felt like he had to take these hearts out of people and do this. But the New Guinea, no, let's not go to Montezuma because that's like ancient history. This is today in New Guinea. So no, I, I don't accept this idea that we're, we're Christian. I think that is from Christians. I, I can't just say Hollywood sucks. Uh, um, I could stop watching Hollywood product, but I couldn't, I can't just get Hollywood out of my system because I decide that I don't like Hollywood because I grew up on it. So even if we're not raised Christian, we're raised in a Christian culture. So those values are they're hardwired into our identity. I don't buy that to the extent that, I mean, this is, this is kind of like our discussion on, on entertainment, which, y you know, you, you win that one because it's all, the, where we put our point of emphasis. And I'd say the same thing like with, with Hollywood. And, and I want to know more about, is that book out currently? No, I'm just rewriting it now last minute because I funded, I did a crowdfunder and I raised, <clears throat> all my, I mean, I raised enough to publish it. I'm just raised, trying to raise another thousand to get a hardback edition before August 8th. And then uh, I've got to, send it to the printers in August. So probably out in October or something like that. Nice, nice. Okay, we'll recap that at the yeah. end. But I, I guess my point was going to be, I, I think you can 
disengage from Hollywood to, uh, to a significant degree just by understanding what you're saying. Just by, I mean, the realization, if you trace back through your history, anyone's history, when you become aware of this stuff, you can never look at it the same way. So I would suspect that already you cannot look at Hollywood movies the way that, you know, sure, 90%. Sure. So the same is true with Christianity, you know. So well, when you watch South Park destroy the Catholic Church, you can't go into the Catholic Church the same way, even if you're quote unquote a devout Catholic, you, it's it's never no, going to be the same, and it shouldn't ever be level. the same. This is all at a conscious level. So what I'm referring to is the the, the constructed identity, which is constructed uh, during the same time that we develop language. So we develop a sense of who we are, existing as a, an actual individual self, this internalized, illusory sense that we exist you know, as a person, that, I'm talking about that thing. So for that to come undone, I mean, for us to be entirely liberated and now ironically getting into, you know, the, the rationale for transgression and any number of pathologies, but to be fully liberated from that constructed identity, trauma generated self, uh, and thereby by extension, the culture that co-created it, we would have to go all the way back, or we do have to go all the way back to that original formation, you know, undo the original formation. So that, that's what I'm referring to. But I wonder if that is, is true and consistent with what we both, I think, really identified with in terms of a personal spirituality, and that maybe the undoing process isn't what we've been told it is. Because I think a lot of times we're told that it is this deep, you know, cleansing and bringing up and, and, and I maybe think, it's... Yeah, that, that I would, I agree with. We don't know how it could just happen overnight. It could happen the way that I think you were describing, which is to just let it be. Let it, let the light It wasn't reach just it. letting it be because billions of people are just letting it be and they just carry on watching Netflix. But it's with awareness, like you were talking about before. Letting with the light. So that, invo that does involve a willingness to engage and explore and examine and to look and to not look away and to keep looking and keep going, moving one's awareness deeper and deeper into those areas that the light hasn't shone on. So, and that, that does involve being liminal and as you said being in a state of doubt and not and not adding new convictions to the old ones you see what i mean not replacing old convictions with new ones it it requires really not knowing and um because i mean you talk about christianity or i talk about hollywood but actually the underpinnings of our identity um are even deeper than those things right it's, it's easy enough to reanalyze data and reach different conclusions and say, okay, Christianity is all psyop, don't have to worry about that. Okay, Crowley was a child abuser, don't have to believe in any of that. Okay, Hollywood's run by pedophiles, don't have, right? It's easy, it's, I mean, it's hard, that is hard. Most people can't do that. But relatively, it's easy enough to perform those, you know, procedures, to follow those procedures compared to, Go, I don't know how to describe the other thing because I haven't fully done it, but it's affect. Like our identity is hardwired into our nervous system through this traumatic impact of both locally and, and globally. You know, the culture has narrowed to this fine laser point of our parenting and any other abuses that happen. And that has imprinted us biologically as this overwhelming affect out of which has kind of spewed this robotic, constructed identity as a defense against that affect and so really to let go of that defensive identity is to re-experience all the overwhelming anguish of that original affect of the original wound and i'm not saying that can be done or, or I, I, you know because i don't know I, I just just the that kind of undoing is a much deeper undoing or that kind of letting go, I should say, is a much deeper letting go than letting go of a religious belief or an affiliation with that or that, you know? It's, it's, it's cell deep, it's in the cells. 
Uh, again, I'll always say the same thing. I, I'm totally with you. It's deep right up to the end. <laughs> then I, I disagree. Let me throw a couple things on the table and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah. A couple of spiritual teachers add a couple of guideposts here that are meaningful to me. The first is with regard to all the deep cell level cleansing I start with don't complain about the weather. So complaining about the weather is, gets right to the heart of it, right? It's me. I hate when it rains on the weekend. Oh, it's a sunny day. It's too cold, it's too hot. I am somehow this little me that is defined by my likes and dislikes. And I can get into that and analyze that to you know, all this great extent, but how about just don't complain about the weather? That's something I try and do. It seems to work. It seems to be part of my spiritual path. And number two, I learned a long time ago, because I, I really appreciate the yoga, the physical practice of it. My very first teacher, he told me this, that it looked like he was brilliant at doing these really, he's a real, like a Dallas Cowboy football player kind of yogi guy could really do these things. He said, don't anticipate the pose. And when we, when you do yoga, if you do any kind of strenuous physical activity, your mind immediately goes to, oh, when will this be over? What's next? Mm -hmm. What am I going to have for lunch? And mm -hmm. not anticipating the pose doesn't require any cell level rehashing of your Christian programming, but might, as we were talking about, have the effect of moving you further along the spiritual path than doing that. That's been my experience. Yeah, well, I, I was trying to make clear qualify that I wasn't suggesting there was a doing about the cells, just that there's something in us that prevents us from relaxing and letting our life force flow into life and to be fully open to life and fully engaged with living. And that's, that's what needs to happen is a total relax. And that no changing ideology is going to allow for that relaxation. I'm not saying that we have to purge every cell, just that this, for some reason, and I think it is trauma-based, uh, our, our, our nervous system isn't relaxed. It is tensed up. It is locked up. And until that ha until that release happens, we should we can't make up our mind about anything really, and maybe we won't need to once that happens. And then, I mean, my feeling about religion, and I do want to bring it back to that, specifically Christianity, I would suggest reading Girard for a counterpoint, René Girard, because there's a very deep understanding of Christianity that, that goes beyond PSYOP, and, and, but it doesn't have to argue that it's, you know, a received revelation either, but just as a, a deep application of it. Um, but my, yeah, my understanding about religious doctrine is is that it's a, it's another tool, and that it can get us to a place uh, of relaxing and of trusting and of surrendering to life if it's rightly used. In a way, I would say occultism probably can't, but that maybe that's me. Maybe I'm just too hardline on occultism, uh, and and so. Um, I don't have a strong position on Christianity. I'm, that's where I really get to be liminal because quite a lot of my listeners are Christian and sometimes annoyingly so. I mean, I've got a, there's a Christian I ban. I don't, I don't let comment at my site because he's so virulent. But there are other Christians who aren't that way and I can see that it seems to work for them and I, can, I think I can see why. So I think uh, I just, well, for me, it's, a, it's that, that's a, an area where I'm very aware of of the difficulty but the reward of staying liminal. I can talk with you or another skeptic about it and be open. I can also talk with a with a pretty virulent Christian and, and be open to their perspective. That's very, very hard actually to be able to be that to spread that it's in between two poles to actually extend one's awareness to both extremes. Actually, it's harder for me to relate to you, what you're saying about Joe Atwell, I have to say. I'm closer to the dogmatic Christian, but I really can't stand dogmatic Christians. We've been at this for two hours, so I hate to open up a can of worms that would I know. You know, take us back yeah, there. Yeah, but I yeah. cannot resist, because I think this does wind us all the way back at the beginning. Like, if you don't like Joe Atwell and Christianity as a weaponized... 
Yeah, I've spoken to Joe, so I do like him. It's if you don't like Joe's idea about Christianity as a weaponized psyop, then great, just present counter evidence. It could be a weaponized psyop. What I don't like and I doubt that any evidence would change my view on is that that would anyway prove that there wasn't a reality. Because every weaponized psyop that I've seen used real stuff. It, it relies on real principles, real figures, real historical events. Jason, this is like the, the oldest thing in the book. It's like, at that point, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because the narrative, the story is completely changed, completely undermined. It's like the reality of satanic ritual abuse. If there's no reality to it, then there's no discussion. If it is real, then we need, then the, the entire discussion changes. So that's the same thing with Christianity. If, it, if its origins do have connections to a social engineering control mechanism of the Romans, then yeah. everything, every fundamental tenet of that religion has to be looked at in a different way. So why would you even allow for Christ consciousness if you're not going to allow for a Christ? Well, two, two things. Number one, I'm a kind of follow the data guy. So when I look at, I start with consciousness and I say, gee, consciousness seems to be real. Despite what Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's never studied consciousness, says that it's an illusion, it's not. In every and we have that scientifically. So next, if that is true, then we can start taking seriously the experiences that people have and start looking at those. And when we do, we have a lot of people that are experiencing Christ. I just interviewed the latest episode up on Skeptico is a guy named David Ditchfield, who had an why incredible... Him, if you're rejecting the whole Christian edifice, why name it Christ at all? For the same reason that when we talk about sat Satan and satanic ritual abuse, and you know, and uh, I have an interview up there with Anna Kalukas, who at six years old in Belgium was sold by her mother to a yeah, sat satanic I, I, ritual abuse cult and almost died. Was on the chopping block to die, you know. So, that one, yeah. so they they are connecting with. This is their this is their experience. They are connecting with a being, a spirit being in the extended realm that they identify as Satan. So I have to reconcile that with, you know, the fact that Satan doesn't exist historically. So, you know, you talked about the egregoria or the uh, topa thing in the, you know, apparently in some way we don't totally understand. We are co-creating this reality. So if we want to create Satan, Satan appears. It, it, David Ditchfield, the yeah. near-death experiencer, who was dragged under a commuter train and died, he saw Jesus. That was his experience, and it transformed his life. I don't question the, the, the fact that he encountered Christ consciousness. Now, spiritual people will tell me, well, that's what he encountered, what he needed to encounter, and it can embody any form that he understands it to be, just like we do in lucid dreaming. Yeah, but if Christianity was a social engineering program only, and it wasn't based in a real spiritual being called Christ, then Christ consciousness would be wholly a product of the social engineering program and just a manufactured no. illusion. Well, 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 I mean, I was, again, I can agree with half of that and not with the other half, you know, because I, I think that is, again, I think that, Tibetan Buddhists, for one, have a deeper understanding of how we are co-creating this reality and how both can exist at the same time. And that, you know, Jesus of the, you know, it's like, so in my interview with David Ditchfield, super nice guy. And like one of the things that's phenomenal about his near-death experience with so many of these near-death experiencers is the obvious spiritual transformation that they go, that he goes through. His life is changed dramatically and significantly, and his life speaks to that. He also develops these unbelievable abilities. He's able to produce this incredible art. He, he has no art training at all, but he came out of the near-death experience, and he's doing these incredible large-scale art and composing music. And he has this art, and it's Jesus. And I ask him about it. He goes, yes. I encountered Jesus, 
and it was amazing. And I saw Jesus and I looked over to the side and I saw the world being created and stars and this and that. And I said, okay, but you understand that the people that have studied near-death experience scientifically, if you will, you know, across culture, across time, large numbers of people, different medical conditions, consistently they say that Jesus is just one aspect, one possible connection that you can have. And they're consistent about this, the, all these other aspects, but Jesus seems to be just one story that can be spun. And he was like, no, Alex, I encountered Jesus. So I said, mm-hmm. David, let me approach it a different way. I've had people that have had multiple near-death experiences on the show. And what they tell me is sometimes what they experience in their first near-death experience gives way to a deeper truth that they experience in subsequent near-death experiences. And it goes deeper and higher, if you will. And some of these people have a sense that Jesus was a necessary entry point for them to understand the light and the love, but that that kind of fell away as they got deeper into it. I don't know if that's the answer. I don't know if that's reality, but I can see how that could play into this. Because to think that David not only saw Jesus, like the Jesus of the, you know, movies, but that when he rolled over the bed, he actually saw the universe being created. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but that, it's low hanging fruit. Of course, people are deluded. And I would say, you know, 999 out of a thousand of these, any of these experiences, I'd say the same about alien abduction. I'd say the same about near death experiences. They may well be delusional. Uh, there are so many levels of psychic manipulation going on. But it does, I mean, that doesn't mean, to finish that point, that, I mean, one can't, what's one going, going to refer to here? If, it's like the enlightenment problem, that because there's thousands of people out there claiming to be enlightened, that we can pretty much see, at least establish for our own satisfaction, they're deluded. That that shouldn't lead us to then say that anyone who says they're enlightened is deluded or lying, because then we're saying that enlightenment doesn't exist, or that somebody who got enlightened would never speak about it. And that would be a mistake, I think, indisputably and arguably. So we just have to kind of leave it open. Well, I don't know. Enlightenment, I, I intuitively, I know that enlightenment exists for myself. I have that felt sense in my life. So I've got, you know, it's, it's, I've got no dogma around that, but I've also got no doubt that what I mean by enlightenment has some kind of real reality. But as far as people out there claiming to it, well, it's unknown. I just assume most of them are deluded and most of them I look at seem to confirm that assumption. But I can only really speak to the ones I encounter directly. And that's only two, really. So I've met one who I think was deeply deluded and another I think is is being honest about it. They are in this different state and good for them. It's wonderful to be close to that. So I'd say the same with, I mean, it goes even much more for Christ and Christianity. Uh, we, we can only really refer A to our experience with other Christians and these people you're talking about on a case by case basis and B our own experience with Christ and or Christianity. And my sense about Christ and Christianity is that I mean, I said this about evil, like evil isn't possibly a necessary word just because there is a, there is a reality that if we're going to identify and talk about it, well, it, it's pretty evil. Uh, but I'd say that much more so about Christ and Christianity, although it's in a more abstract way, that they do represent something real, something profoundly real. When you say real now, are you talking about historically? Well, there isn't really a history of Christ. It's just the Bible. So I can't really say it's historically, can I? But narratively, I mean... Well, well narratively then is, is historically... I don't think it was all made up. I'll put it that way. But, I mean, this is, yeah. this is... I didn't realize you were so Christian. Okay, I don't think anything is all made up. I, I just right. don't think it really That's gets us to... An interesting counterpoint, wouldn't it? Because uh, in much safer ground is Castaneda. Because my feeling with Castaneda is he's, he's been 
he's been too thoroughly or not thoroughly enough debunked but too easily dismissed that castaneda's books are part of the psyop and to a degree and that castaneda was lying and that he probably was heavily compromised and quite pathological but there's incredibly profound truths in those books and i don't just mean that it's metaphorical truth i think there's actual literal truth in those books so i'd say the same about the gospel there's there's literal truth in there and there's a literal truth that there was a guy who walked this planet who was in a state of grace let's say that was very very unusual you know i'm not saying it was unprecedented that he's the the son of god that stuff's trickier that becomes quite abstract and i'd see it more like a mathematical formula that that represents some base reality in the universe is my sense like the trinity and so on but the uh, you know this is very we could go on for hours with this but the, the 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 sort of specific point i want to make is is that the idea and i said this about castaneda the idea if castaneda made all that stuff up he was way greater genius than than anyone i can even think of in history like for somebody to just make that up would just require such skill talent imagination i just don't believe it so the idea that social engineers you know or secret societies could completely create christianity as a cynical tool of manipulation makes them on a level of, of angelic in, in a way this relates back to the quote unquote focus of this interview although it hasn't been and, yeah. and that's the, what you suspect or what I suspect is, you know, potentially a PSYOP. And I could, think it, it is... A good counterpoint. Yeah, Simon and the Necronomicon. I mean, how shoddy and inept that is comparatively. It was effective, but it, it's paper thin. It's so easy to take apart, like the Tom DeLonge thing. Christianity, 2,000 years later, still people devoutly following it. You can't say they're all dupes. René Girard was a genius. He was one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. And he converts to Catholicism based, Catholicism based on what he understood about the gospel. I, I don't really agree that he should have converted to Catholicism. I think that's a bit crazy, but personally, but whatever, he, he was smarter than I was. So I've got to give some credit where I do. And he's reframed Christianity for me that it's almost like, it's almost beyond faith in a way. It's just like, it's so profound what he reveals there in the gospel. So profound that it's almost indistinguishable from a holy book, I would say, the level of awareness that went into it. So yeah, psyop, well, maybe, but do an, an angels do psyops? Maybe they do. And how do we know? You know, if Christ consciousness is real, what are we saying then? That maybe Christ manipulated the social engineers to create a fake version of it so that people would experience, you know, it, it gets just so convoluted and bizarre it does get convoluted and bizarre but then i think that's at the point at which it gets spiritual because we let go of the rational we let go of the level three kind of thing that you know we're going to fight about whether it's crowley or whether it's q or whether it's you know all this kind of stuff and, and we let go into this larger reality my point is that i you can't bring your historical Jesus along with you as part of that reality. So all the great minds in time that have connected with Christ consciousness, which is all you could ever, I don't understand why people, I, I interviewed an evangelical preacher that I really like, his name is Russ Dizdar, and he spent the last 30 years working with victims of satanic ritual abuse and really helping people. He's a people helper because uh, imagine if you are such a victim and you have really have nowhere to turn, you know, the people are saying, well, there isn't, can't be that because it, there is no such thing as Satan. And yet they're, they're victims and they, they have been victimized in that. But anyways, I was having this kind of similar conversation with Russ, but when you talk to any Christian, it always it, it, they always react to this idea of Christ consciousness. And I always want to say, well, how can you react to that? How else are you experiencing Jesus? I'm like giving you the highest compliment that you are experiencing Christ through some kind of extended consciousness experience. Why are you programmed, triggered to react to that and go, no, it's not Christ consciousness and your God Gnostic craziness. It's really Jesus. It's like, what do you mean it's really Jesus? 
But I can understand why, because of the whole new age thing, the whole new age conspiracy. Yeah, well, they need to be, hold on to that a little bit more loosely, because holding on to the biblical narrative in that history is really problematic. Well, I'll just put it at that. Well, I think any kind of holding on is problematic. So I, I imagine there's an awful lot of people out there believing in Christ consciousness that are just stuck in their own rat, new age ruts around that, and that they've been psyoped and socially engineered to believe in Christ consciousness. So there we go, you know, we've got these, this polarization. It's not Christ consciousness, it's Jesus. It's not Jesus, it's Christ consciousness. Well, you know, maybe it's both, maybe it's neither, but... But just to be clear on this point, how could it be Jesus? Jesus would be Christ consciousness. I think when they say it's Jesus, what they mean is it's the only son of God and the only way is through him and so on, which I say there's a mass, of ma I don't know if mathematical is the word, but, but I find there, is, there are sound principles there that can be observed and played. And play so this was a and, special point in history. 2,000 years ago yeah. was a special point in history. What evidence? We, we just don't have why any not? evidence for why, that. It's an outrageous why statement. Why but why wouldn't there be special points in history? Not so, special points. The, the one and only that absolutely you, is inconsistent with everything we know about have you, history. Have you read, um, have you read Rudolf Steiner? Uh, yeah, as much as I can, as much as I can take, and I think there's some wonderful things in what Stein does. I mean, because I, I don't recommend any kind of occultist, but he's as close as I get to an occultist who seemed to be tuning into some interesting things. And he, I mean, he had some interesting takes on that. I, I just think um, it seems that, that Alex, that you have a strong conviction around this, which is like a bulwark against. I don't convictions. I don't have a strong conviction. It's just plain from the evidence. I, I'm totally open to someone who can present. But, but that's I mean, what most people with always say. They say, oh, no, it's just plain from the evidence. But here's the point is, is like you say you're open to talking to Christians and dialoguing with Christians. I am yeah. too. As long as you acknowledge that, like you acknowledge that, hey, the Bible is pro Roman and the essence of what Joe Atwell says is proven in the texts is that well, the no, Bible is dependent. The, They'd have to well, be familiar with Joe Atwell. That's not an impossible yeah. hurdle to overcome. You're, you you're could, putting an, an, an unfair condition on it. I could just say to you, well, I can't talk to you until you've read René Girard. I'm not putting a, a condition on it, but I'm saying, I, I, I don't think we're, we're really, I don't know why you're fighting on this one, because this, this is the point that we had earlier. I mean, yeah. if, you're, if someone isn't willing to read the email exchange you had with Peter Lavenda, and yet they want to form an opinion, which I'm sure a lot of people do, majority of people form a, an opinion on your exchange. Because I've had this, I just had, I was just interviewed for, for my book uh, just a while ago, and I won't even say who it's with, but guy really like, really respect. And I brought this up and I said, you know, Jason totally destroyed and outed Lavenda. And he was like, no, he didn't. I said, well, have you read it? He goes, no, but I know what Lavenda says. And, you know, it's so they don't need the evidence or they don't need to deeply dive into the evidence. Sure. But I'm not the saying answer. Joe Atwell. So that's the, same, not, that's the same thing with Atwell. I'm not doing that Joe Atwell's argument. I'm not saying you are. You, you are saying that Christians who come to your site, a Christian that comes to my site and is willing to listen to the interviews with Joe Atwell and have a, a reasoned response to say, I don't think the Bible is pro-Roman because of this, 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 then I'm willing to listen to that. As a matter of fact, I've gone out and tried to engage with, and I have interviews on the show, engaged with Christian scholars, engaged with religious scholars who are atheists because they don't like Atwell either. And I wrestle those people to the ground and they all wind up admitting at the end that the gospels are dependent on Josephus. In other words, the people who wrote the gospels clearly had access to Josephus's writing. This is, this is like a, a, a point that you can wrestle people to the ground on. And they, yeah, but they, why, why are we even talking about it is the thing. This is <laughs> in the opening. I said how you're tenacious. I'm tenacious on, on certain things too. I, I think know, the, why, why this? I mean, because this if the Bible, if the Bible is pro-Roman, 
then yeah, but we why can have to hear about it. I haven't even read Joe Atwell's thing. I mean, I obviously don't have the tools to answer these questions. All I can tell you is what my position is. And you'll say, yeah, but this, that, and the other. And I say, well, maybe, but I'd have to take the time to get familiar with Joe's stuff. And then we could talk about that, right? Well, Otherwise, I mean, you clearly you've, you've, you've put me at a big disadvantage. Uh, and if I'm not careful, I'll end up seeming like I'm super pro Christian or anti Joe Atwell. Or I'm not. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm not convinced because I haven't looked at it. But, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I'm guessing there are some leaps being made there because I'm not set. I mean, maybe Paul was a, was a Roman agent. I'm perfectly open to that. He was a good writer. So it would be a bit distressing to think that they had agents at that level of poetic insight. But yeah, I'm not ruling out that Christianity was co-opted from day one by St. Paul or Paul, right? At all, why would I? And, and nor am I saying I know, obviously I don't know that, that Christ was a real person who walked on the earth. I'm just saying that's, that's what I think. Um, and, but my, my general point is, as I don't see a, incongruity between the Christian view that Christ is this and Christ is that and that's all wonderful and that Christianity was a psyop. Those two things are, are quite compatible to me. That's, that's the only point I'm making, I think. Our guest, who I've dragged through, a just delightful to me anyway, two and a half hour conversation, has written some fantastic books that you have to check out and has this website that I keep talking about Autoculture, as well as his podcast, The Luminist, all great, great stuff. Really an important thinker, I think, just in general. I'll just leave it at that. An important thinker of our time and, a, and, a, and an analyst of our culture that is just not to be ignored. Jason, tell folks what's going on with these books, where they can find them, and an update on 16 Maps of Hell. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks, Alex, for that. It was quite entertaining uh, all through, but particularly at the end, I'm glad we got into, you know, a, a more dynamic thing. It's always, it's quite a rare opportunity, I think, to really connect. Uh, as far as my site is horticulture.com, the podcast is the Limo as a, a weekly thing. Um, the books I've written are Seen and Not Seen, uh, Prisoner Infinity, Vice of Kings, also Dark Oasis. Uh, and that's the, those first three is kind of a trilogy of socio-cultural engineering. And 16 Maps of Hell was an attempt to kind of synthesize those, the different fields, which is organized abuse and secret societies with Vice of Kings, uh, the entertainment industry, which is seen and not seen, and uh, kind of psychosocial uh, cultural engineering, which is Prisoner Infinity. And that, so they're all brought together for 16 Maps of Hell. And I couldn't find a publisher for this, much to my surprise, even though it was about Hollywood. It's, you know, it was all this Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and Jeffrey Epstein. It seemed like it was a very topical subject. But despite that, I could not find a publisher. And even the publisher that I was with previously, Aeon Books, weren't interested. So I ended up crowdfunding to get it published and I've raised over the last two months now or six weeks I think it is um, almost 8,000 pounds which is going to cover a, a run of 200 books I think paperbacks it's a, it's a very large book and an audio book which I'll be doing and so I'm just currently trying to raise another thousand to fund a hardback edition because some people like hardback edition and that, that, that campaign goes through to August Eighth. So people who are interested, they can pre-order the book, and by doing so, they'll help fund the hardback. I think that's so encouraging to hear that people are willing to get involved in that way. It's almost like even better than having a publisher. That, that's my experience. I'm connecting directly to the readers. I know their names, their addresses. I'll be inscribing the books personally and posting them. I'm having a direct connection to my readers. It's far more satisfying, actually, than this, you know, evasive review in the New York Times, which, uh, which I spent so long, you know, chasing after some dream that actually was, was not, I think, what I was looking for, because what I was looking for was a sense of community connecting to other souls out there and sharing 
my experience. So yeah, this does seem to be the natural organic way. And I'm not using Amazon. I mean, Amazon is not included in my project. Well, I'm, I'm just very happy that you're part of my community and that you're in my head. I just really, really respect and admire what you do, and I'm so glad you're doing it. Well, thanks, Alex, and, and ditto. I, mean, I was impressed by your willingness to take on the Lavender Leviathan because not very few others have, have followed, you know, what I've done or picked up what I've done and been willing to you know, take it further. So uh, kudos for that. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity today. Thanks again to Jason Horsley for joining me today on Skeptico. You know, the one question I guess I'd tee up from this interview has to do with this blog post about his exchange about Crowley with Peter Lavenda. So the question kind of requires that you are somewhat familiar with that post. And it is, what do you think of the Crowley apologists? I mean, is Aleister Crowley this kind of iconoclastic, misunderstood, rebel against oppressive cultural norms? Or is he just a bad guy who likes to do bad things? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Of course, the easiest, best place to do it, if you want to get a reply from me, is at the Skeptical Forum. So do check that out. And also consider jumping over to the Skeptico.com website where you can download this show and all the previous shows. Get them in a nice, easy MP3 format that you can do with as you see fit. No ads, no firewall, no nothing like that. Just take the info and go with it. Hey, I do have a number of, I don't know, I think they're really good shows coming up. So please stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.